Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to part three of uh, my live chatting about Xmas in July, uh, a new psychedelic feature film that I am directing and is currently on Kickstarter. Uh, please check out the project page um, for more information on the movie. Uh, today, I'm going to be chatting with my longtime collaborator, writing partner, Dave Boyle. Uh, Dave has made five f feature films in the past nine years. Um, he is an imitable filmmaker and very excited to be talking with him today. And I'm very, also very excited that he will be editing the feature. Uh, he'll be editing Xmas in July. Um, he is just returning to his home in LA from Fantastic Fest in Austin, where our latest collaboration, Man from Reno, um, his latest film, uh, screened, um, and he had uh, he had some adventures uh, coming to and fro from um, from Austin. So he's going to fill us in on all of that. He'll be with me in just a minute. Um, I'll take this moment to plug my next interview, which is going to be um, tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm going to be talking with my uh, a musician and collaborator, Rubicon, a.k.a. Ian Turner, uh, about his latest album and his involvement on Xmas in July. So um, Dave will be here momentarily. Um, he's had quite an adventure at Fantastic Fest. Um, but let me just give you a little bit of background on our collaboration. Uh, the first film that I worked on of Dave's was White on Rice, which came out in 2009. Uh, that was his second feature film. Uh, it featured uh, Hiroshi Watanabe, uh, and it was a sort of a screwball family comedy. Um, and we worked on the script together. Uh, we followed that up with Surrogate Valentine, which was uh, starring Go Nakamura, uh, as a sort of uh, musician trying to find love. And that film came out in 2011 and premiered at South by Southwest. And the following year, 2012, we, uh, we wrote and Dave, Dave made Daylight Savings, which was a sequel to Surrogate Valentine. And our latest collaboration was a murder mystery called Man from Reno, uh, which is currently touring festivals and was the winner of the Narrative Jury Prize at the LA Film Festival this year in June. Um, so please check that out. There, uh, there is a, a website. The website is manfromrenomovie.com where you can get information on upcoming screenings and how to get your hands on that film. So once again, just waiting for Dave Boyle. Um, He's had an epic journey to and from Austin. Uh, he, uh, Man from Reno just screened at Fantastic Fest. Um, I also heard that uh, the, our lead actor, Pepe Serna, from Man from Reno, happened to win the nerd rap battle at Fantastic Fest, which honestly doesn't really surprise me. Um, for anyone who's ever met Pepe, uh, he is a force of nature, and he cannot be contained. So congratulations to Pepe uh, on his win uh, at the Nerd Rap Battle at Fantastic Fest. Um, seemed like a great time they were having down there. Um, just to fill you all in, uh, this is a conversation I'm having with Dave Boyle when, as soon as he arrives. Um, about our collaboration. We've been collaborating for eight years, uh, writing films together, uh, films that he has directed. Um, and he is on board Xmas in July, my new feature film, as editor and co-producer. Um, he is a terrific film editor. Uh, he edits his own features with the help of some others. Um, and I'm very excited to uh, to give him the challenge of editing a psychedelic Christmas film um, 
and I'm, I'm very interested to see what he does with it uh, once we get the whole thing shot. So uh, the Kickstarter is going pretty well. Uh, if you want to check out the project page, you can check it out. It's Xmas in July on Kickstarter. Um, let me just see if we're live here. We are. That's good. And I believe Dave will be here shortly. Um, we had a our, the last of our sort of pre-production shooting days uh, here um, in Brooklyn. Uh, we had uh, we shot a few scenes from Section One of Xmas in July, where Ebenezer Scrooge finds himself to be uh, a famous rock musician. Uh, he wakes up in this alternate reality where he has this great success as a rock musician, but he's uh, addicted to drugs. He's out of control. He uh, and he's sort of a uh, sort of uh, a, uh, an un unwilling participant in the lifestyle of of a of an out of control rock musician. Um, so the shoot went very well. Uh, we had on set um, the musician Greg Fox, who I did a Google chat with last week. You can check that out. Um, it's posted on the Kickstarter page in the updates uh, as well as on our Facebook page. Um, you can find find us on Facebook by searching for Xmas in July. Uh, the hashtag is Xmas in July. You can find us on Twitter. Um, so in any case, um, <laughs> I was uh, I was I was lucky enough to be on set for about three weeks of shooting of Man from Reno. Uh, Man from Reno was shot in, mostly in San Francisco, uh, and then we did four days in San Juan Batista, uh, and then the the team continued on for another I'm not sure how many days uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, I had to come back to Brooklyn to help launch the Moby Dick card game on Kickstarter, which uh, if, if you haven't heard, of, heard about it, you can check it out at mobydickgame.com. It's an adaptation of Moby Dick into a narrative adventure game, tabletop game for two to four players. Um, and so that was in March of 2013, I believe, or April. Uh, and it was amazing to be on set with Dave and the the DP of that project, Rich Wong, uh, who was an incredible, uh, incredible uh, with the camera, and the incredible performances of Pepe Serna and Ayako Fujitani uh, and all the other actors. Um, it was really amazing to see a script, uh, to see to to hand a script to to such talented performers and. Uh, and see them bring their own kind of energy to it, um, which was, uh, I mean, it's a cliche, but it was a total dream come true. Uh, and then, and it was like, they made the writing 10 times better, and, uh, and the shooting made the writing 10 times better. And what I sort of learned, what I took away from my um, experience on set of Man From Reno was basically that the writing is almost the least important part. It's not the least important part, but it's something like the writing is similar to the lighting. Like It's something that you shouldn't notice. Um, you shouldn't be noticing the writing or noticing how a scene is lit. But uh, really what what is important are the performances of the actors and sort of the way that the, 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 way that the emotional performance of the actors kind of propels the story forward. Um, and I think that was done really amazingly well at, in Man from Reno, and I was so um, I was so blown away by the talent of everybody on set, and it inspired me very much uh, to to try to shoot my own feature and to try to run a set the same way that Dave that Dave does. So once again, we're just waiting for Dave. Um, he is just returning from Austin, where uh, Man from Reno was screened at Fantastic Fest. I believe he's looking for parking uh, in his neighborhood in, in Los Angeles, which I know can be tricky um, from my time that I've spent out there. Um, once again, 
This is a chat about uh, Xmas in July, which is a psychedelic feature film, an adaptation of Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol into modern day, uh, a Scrooge origin story in which uh, Scrooge finds himself as a young man uh, to be powerless and penniless and he wakes up in three alternate futures where he has experienced success in one way or another uh, but each dream reality sort of turns into a nightmare. So you can check out our project page on Kickstarter. Um, it's Xmas in July and we could use any support you'd be willing to to give. Uh, we Our shooting schedule is slated to begin on October 8th and we'll be shooting through October 25th uh, here in New York and then we will be moving out to LA to shoot uh, for a few days um, at, at a few locations out in Los Angeles. So, oh, look who it is. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I believe Dave Boyle is uh, is on the line. I see his little picture there. But is he actually there? There he is. Hey. The man himself. How's it going? Good morning. Hey, Sorry man. Hello out there in YouTube land. Uh, I can't hear you. You can't hear can me? You? Oh, there you are. You can hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. All right. Hi, Dave. Hey, Joel. Hey, buddy. How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Um, so I've just been sort of blah, blah, blahing about our uh, our writing partnership and, and the films that you've made. But uh, what I'd love to hear about is the, uh, the adventure that you've had at Fantastic Fest this past couple days. Um, Are you talking about the adventure on the way to Fantastic Fest or the actual adventure at Fantastic Fest? I mean, it sounds yeah. like there's a, a really a lot going on there. So <laughs> I think we should start with the uh, national news broadcast uh, uh, story of your, uh, your fated trip. Yeah, well, um, if any of you... So some of you might have seen on the news that there was a JetBlue flight that had an engine failure, um, or as the JetBlue press person said in the official press conference, a um, the engine overheated. But from inside the plane, it sounded like the engine exploded in a big ball of fire and smoke. <laughs> At least that's what it looked like. Um, but o overheated? Sure. You know, when my car overheats, it just kind of shudders to a stop. But this was like... <sighs> but um, anyway, um, yeah, no, I was, I was on my way out to Fantastic Fest. I was super excited to go, but I was also, I was also kind of bummed because there was like this review that came out that was largely positive, but like spoiled the end of the movie in the first paragraph. And... Um, so I was feeling kind of bummed about that. Little did I know, 20 minutes later, I would just be like so happy to be no no longer in a plane and and also actually breathing. But yeah, we took it off, and then um, I don't know. It was like it was just a little bit after. You know how there's always the bong, and then they're like, "It's you are cleared to use, um, you know, electronic devices or whatever." It was a little bit after that, then all of a sudden there was just this big boom, and then all of a sudden you could see smoke out the window. Whoa. And then, so everybody was like, what's going on, what's going on, what's going on? And, um, and, there was, and then all of a sudden smoke started pouring in through the, the air conditioner vent units. Yeah. And then... And then it just broke out into like total pandemonium, and the entire plane just completely filled with smoke. Like you couldn't, you couldn't, you could barely see anything. Everybody was like coughing and choking, and you know, asking the flight attendants, "What's going on? What's going on?" And the flight attendants were like, oh, "I don't know." And then, uh, and then they were like, "Stay in your seats. Don't use the lavatory. No smoking." <laughs> 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 like, I don't know, I'm not sure I can, uh, at that point I already felt like I'd gone through an entire pack of Marlboros. Um, 
<laughs> and then, uh, so, yeah, there there was no word for a little while what was going on, but then the pilot said, like, you know, hold on, we're turning around, we're going to go back to Long Beach, we lost the right side engine. And then, uh, so then we turned around, and, you know, planes can fly with one, only one engine. The the smoke was, oh, yeah, and that was the other thing, is that there's not, like, a, you know, the, the oxygen masks? They yeah, deploy, yeah. they deploy, like, when there's a sudden loss of pressure, but since it was just cabin, the cabin filling up with smoke, then, like, um, the flight attendants had to go through and manually unlock each one, and then, like, you pull it down and pull it over your head and everything. And uh, you know what? The bag did not inflate, just like they say. It. Just like they say that it, it probably won't. And uh, <laughs> well, now so, we know for sure the bag does not inflate. The bag does not inflate. So if you're ever in a midair emergency, you fix your own mask before you affix a mask on a helpless child. Yeah, you don't. Yeah, you don't have to. Um, yeah, yeah, totally. I I didn't have a helpless child with me, so it was all good. Um. But yeah, there was like there was a girl across the aisle from me who was crying really hard, and then I didn't, I didn't, I was just kind of, uh, like, wow, yeah, like I didn't, I was thinking a lot, but I didn't, I didn't like scream or cry or anything, and then, but then, uh, you know, when the pilot said that they just lost the engine that they were turning around, I kind of had the idea like, all right, this could be like a rough landing, but we're gonna. We're gonna make it, you know. We're gonna be all right. So I just, I just reached across the aisle and I was, we're, we're gonna be all right, you know. We're gonna be all right. And she just looked. She gave me this look, like that was just like, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> trying to reach out and say, "It's okay, it's okay." Yeah, and then I was just like, "All right." <laughs> oh, oh, that was what it was. The flight attendant was like, "Excuse me, excuse me," and because my hand was sort of in the way of the aisle. Um, and uh, so, anyway, yeah, everybody was there with their oxygen masks on. Some total jerks had their phones out, filming everybody crying. Oh, which God! I, <laughs> and then, um, and then, like, we landed. And then uh, the dudes in the emergency aisles, like, they, like, you know, popped open the emergency doors even before we had, like, totally, before they had cleared it. And then, like, by that point, it was just, like, pandemonium because the flight attendants were, like, you know, it sounded like Charlie Brown's teacher or something, you know? But, um, yeah, the thing that... The thing that was the scariest part of the whole experience was just like, so we're in this plane full of smoke, and yeah, it's they told us that the engine, it was a, you know, the engine went out, but all these people, as soon as as soon as they cleared us to to go down the slides or whatever, they just stand up and crack open the overhead bins and like, mm, gotta get my rolling suitcase and roll it down the aisle. <laughs> And then, like, tossing it down the slide with them. And it was just like, oh, <laughs> dude. Like, what if the plane was on fire, you know? <laughs> and we're waiting behind these people trying to get their... So then it looked like it was going to become violent because all these people were like, I get, get out of the way, get out of the way, you know, like... Leave your stuff and go, leave your stuff and go. And then, Is that you? Then, Is that you getting violent? No, no, I, I was just kind of weaving around. As... So, yeah, a couple of safety tips I learned. Um, uh, tell us, yeah, tell us about your slide experience. Oh, yeah. So when you're going down the emergency slide after, because, you know, you're going to be, when you when it landed, I was so happy. Like, I, I'm not like an exuberant kind of guy. I'm usually emotionally pretty middle of the road, but for the first time in my life, I put my hands up in the air. I was like, Whoa! <laughs> I was like, yeah! And then, like, I turned, I turned to the older lady next to me, a very, very sweet lady, and I was like, that was awesome! And, like, I <laughs> high-fived her. <laughs> 
And then and then came the potential death trap of everybody trying to get their their Samsonite suitcases out because they're afraid of being stuck without any clean underwear or whatever. Right. Uh, but yeah, then so you go down the slide and those things are marvels of technology because basically like you pop the emergency door right and then that thing inflates in like half a second. It's like <laughs> and it's just there. Um, but they're not made for comfort. You no, know, no, so, this is not a slip and slide. Yeah, yeah, and I finally kind of understood. Um, so if you look at the safety card, which I do every time I fly now, um, there's like this diagram that shows you how not to use the slide, and it has and it has like a big circle and an X through somebody sitting at the edge of the the plane exit and kind of scooching out and then going. And then it has like a thumbs up next to somebody just just bailing, just jumping into the air, and like, and it's and it's true because it slows it slows everybody down. And if you're like, okay, let's see, let's gotta gotta get into the right position and then slide down. You know, you just gotta you just have to bail, but you gotta watch for bare skin because the it's like so oh, this is this is weird, but it was it was a lot worse before. Um, like I, I just barely skimmed. Oh well. So the uh, another very nice elderly lady took the slide before me, and she was still kind of at the bottom of the slide trying to get up off the pavement when I bailed. And so I was like, oh no, I'm gonna like, I'm gonna hit her with a flying jump kick, and this, <laughs> like the one fatality on this, on this midair emergency is gonna be. You know, filmmaker, filmmaker Dave Boyle kills old lady and yeah, young young filmmaker. Yeah, exactly. My career will be over before I ever even started, and so so I like mid and those slides are fast, right? But I was like, ah, and I and I kind of rolled over, and then I I only skimmed I skimmed my elbow for for like a second or something, and it just totally it just took all the skin off my elbow. Huh. It was just. It was disgusting, but I didn't even get the worst of it. There was like somebody in, you know, like a party dress or something, and they they just they just got skinned. Oh no. Um. So safety tips, I'd say, don't take your shoes off. Um. Don't do something stupid like take a bunch of Ambien right before the flight. <laughs> Um, because then you'll just be like, I don't know, man. I guess we're going down. Yeah, yeah. You won't care, and you'll slow everybody else down. Um, and uh, what and, else? And leave your bag. Just leave it. Leave, leave your bag. Yeah, leave your bag. Um, try to try to sit in an aisle, if possible, near one of the exits. Um, wow. Because you know, I was in like row seventeen. So kind of neither here nor there, like ten seats from either one, and you know I was one of the I I I, I just ended up getting, yeah like if the plane was on fire I probably would have been I may not have been able to get out of the plane just because people are so so slow and so worried about their laptops or whatever. <laughs> Drop it and get out the dough. <laughs> Wow. Well, that is unbelievably epic. Um, and then the next day, you just got on another plane and went anyway, which, uh, you yeah, know, I'm not well, going to call you a hero, but, you know. No, no, yeah, I, I am not a hero. Um, but, I mean, they had another plane. So, basically, when something like that happens, then, you know, the fire department and everybody shows up, and everybody just kind of stood on the tarmac for like a half an hour. And when the pilot came out, everybody was like, Woo! you know, and clapping, and all, all, everybody was hugging him, and, like, this woman from Texas was like, I'm going to find out if he's single. And, you know, so it was just like, it was like a bad sitcom on the side of the road. It was, it was so, and, uh, but then we just kind of stood there for a while until they brought in buses to take us back, and then... They put you in a room and give you all the JetBlue snacks that you could ever want, like those blue chips and everything. And you fill, you fill so out. 
some paperwork with, you know, a description of your bag, and you talk to somebody about where, um, what you want to do, if you want to cancel your flight or if you want a new one, and they refunded everybody's flight, whether they were rebooking or not, and gave everybody some JetBlue credit. Um, and then, uh, and then, so I was kind of, I, I had to wait for a ride at the airport, so I was kind of there for a little while. But you know how in, like, bad indie movies, there's always, there's oftentimes, like, or even in just bad movies, period, there's <laughs> often, like, you know, the character of the the hungry cub reporter, like, in a in a mini dress, and she's got, like, a, a, a fat guy who follows her around with a camera trying to get the scoop. Yeah. Everything. I so always... I got you. Whoa. Well, I just I just never believed that that was an actual thing until about thirty of them descended upon the airport. Like you go out, you go out the side door, and then out front there was just all of these news vans and all these people just looking around, and then and then they like chase they would like chase after people. Were you yeah. on that flight? Were you on that flight? And so I just started. I just started granting interviews to every station in town because, you know, Ride's not here anyway. Might as well, right? Um, yeah. And, uh, Any press is good press, right? Did you plug them actually, in? I, I don't know. I felt like I, I was doing it out of boredom and out of trying not – because as soon as I got out of the plane for, like, ten minutes, I was like, I'm never – not only am I never flying again, I'm never traveling again. I'm never leaving my room again. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> like, this, <laughs> I, I am. And yet, the, and yet the next day you continued on to Fantastic Fest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you know, like an hour later, I was like, you know, this is, this is, uh, this is. Not that big of a deal. Well, I got I got off the plane. The first thing I did was I I called my and I called my parents and I called and I called Michael Lerman to let him know what had happened. And Lerman didn't pick up the phone. He's a busy guy. So all I did was take a picture of the plane with the emergency slides down and just texted it to him and saying, I think I'm going to be late to Fantastic Fest. And boom, as soon as I sent it, then he called back, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> I was like... <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know, Michael Lerman is, uh, is another one of our co-writers on Man from Reno and Daylight Savings. Um, and he was at Fantastic Fest uh, for the festivities... Um, so how was so how was Fantastic Fest? Um, it was great. A lot of people wanted to ask me about the flight, and, then, uh, <laughs> and you know, I'd, I'd never met Tim League, the guy who started Draft House and the, mm -hmm. the things and everything. And and um, you know, when I talked to Lerman. One thing that Lerman said was, you know, well, this is this is okay because statistically, like, you'll never have to face something like this again. Like, this is probably your one midair emergency for your lifetime. And I was like, um, I don't, I don't, yeah, okay, I'll think of it that way. And then when I met Tim League, I just started rambling, and I was like, and he, he, because he was like, you know, thanks for coming. I was even after what happened, and I was like, yeah, you know, I was, I. Once, once I thought about it, I was like, statistically, I'll never have to face something like this again, because you know how rare these things are. And he was like, "Well, yeah, you know, statistics don't work that way." And I was like, "Well, <laughs> I know, but like, <laughs> just <laughs> like, I'm, I'm just trying to get through this, something you know." <laughs> just something to hang on to, really. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's a lie. I'm just trying to tell myself and, until I get. <laughs> Just let me lie, Tim Lee. Yeah. Just let me lie. <laughs> but no, it was a it was um, a great time. I basically invite I, I so I I basically arrived just in time to um drop off my stuff, change my clothes real quick, and then run to the theater for the Q and A. Uh, the movie was already already playing when I landed, and wow. um and then uh so I was already a day late. And 
Um, yeah, no, the, the audience is there. Are so active and, uh, you know, crazy enthusiastic and opinionated, you know, the, uh, yeah. nobody pulls any punches. It's, it's amazing. And, and then just, you know, the, it's really, um, it's a really unusual event just because there's so many kind of sideshow things going on. Like they have the fantastic debates, which in the past have been like, you know, a filmmaker and a film critic will argue about something and then they get into the ring and they box it out for two, two rounds. And this time it was one of the, um, fantastic fest programmers slash, and he's also a producer and, um, and then the guy, one of the people from BitTorrent, and they were arguing about really, how, yeah. They were arguing about how whether BitTorrent is has been like beneficial for. So it's it was funny to see because in the VIP section, film critic Leonard Malton and like Nicholas Winding Refn and like the heads of Radius TWC and all these other people were just sitting there watching it, and then some of them were getting like totally into it. You know, yeah. the BitTorrent guy was throwing out T-shirts. And and one of the one of the distributors like grabbed the T-shirt and like chucked it right back at him and, and stuff. And, uh, um, no, I I mean the BitTorrent guy, even though I'm against piracy and everything, I gotta I gotta hand it to him for coming out in a very very hostile environment. Yeah, I Pretty bet. Great. To make so, a point to that kind of crowd, to a bunch of distributors and producers. I mean, that's uh, that's that's gutsy. That's for sure. Yeah, respect. Hats off. And uh, and I heard that Pepe won the nerd rap battle. Oh, oh man, I <laughs> forgot about that. Holy cow! I wish I could show it to you. I think I can show it. You want me to show it? Yeah, I would Is love that. I would absolutely love that. So, for those of you who don't know, um, Pepe Serna was the is the lead actor uh, in Man from Reno. And he also does a one-man show, and he's a very dynamic performer. And at Fantastic Fest, they have a, uh, a, a lovely event called the Nerd Rap Battle, uh, which Pepe apparently uh, threw down at and won decisively. Um, and hopefully Dave is going to be able to hook us up with a little exclusive footage uh, from that particular event. Yeah, um, nobody nobody has seen this. So. Nobody has seen this. So for those of you watching, this is an exclusive. Uh, you know, we got a lot of exclusive information today, like slide safety. You know, in airplanes. Slide, slide safety is huge. Um, so yeah, and so uh, for those of you just tuning in, I'm speaking with filmmaker Dave Boyle. Uh, about his various projects, our various collaborations, and uh, we are discussing Fantastic Fest and his epic journey to and from, uh, as well as Xmas in July, my newest feature film, which is a psychedelic adaptation of A Christmas Carol uh, in modern day, and it is on Kickstarter right now. So you can check out our project page and get more information about that. Um, Dave, do you have that? Do you have that clip queued I got up? It queued up? Yeah. Okay, so here we go. This is Pepe Serna uh, winning the nerd rap battle. Well, let me l okay. let me explain a little further. It's I, I actually, you know, he was only supposed to go for two minutes, and um, he kept Pepe going. Could never do Pepe could never go for just two minutes. Come on. So I only have round one. I don't have the finals, and it cuts out before the end, but still, it's more than... It's enough. Okay. <laughs> You're like, it's enough. <laughs> All right, is that coming up? Mm-hmm. Okay.
That is epic. Um, that's Pepe Serna, uh, lead actor of Man from Reno, throwing down at the nerd rap battle at Fantastic Fest. Exclusive footage. Um, hard to hear what he was rapping about, but I'm sure it was incredible. Oh, I didn't really understand it either. Um, but uh, it was it was far out. <laughs> um, so let's talk about Man from Reno. Um, so, do you want to just uh, sort of intro, like, where, where, where the film is at right now, um, and what, what's going on with it? Well, we're doing film festivals and pretty much um, also showing it to all our Kickstarter backers early, whether it's through online, you know, secure online uh, Netflix-style links or, or otherwise. And um, there's, you know, there's a few more film festivals going through the end of the year, and we're still working out distribution in the U.S. Um, so I think that it'll, it probably won't hit theaters till after the new year. Mm -hmm. But that's uh, so yeah, we've got the Hawaii Film Festival coming up, and yeah. uh, a couple others that haven't haven't announced yet. But yeah, it's going to be a, a busy fall for the movie. Cool. Hopefully, get some some good uh, some good word of mouth without people spoiling. <laughs> spoilers! I don't like spoilers. Yeah, no spoilers, no spoilers. Um, yeah, it is interesting. Um, you know, we uh, you've only done comedies before this, um, and then we sort of embarked on a mystery script, and the whole I mean, spoilers and just in general, kind of the focus on uh, plot movement. Uh, is just much different in the, in the mystery genre than it is in the comedy genre. Um, you know, for example, uh, Xmas in July is an adaptation of of uh, 
of the Christmas Carol. So it's like there's no spoiler there. You know, I'm just it's just going to be a, it's just a comedy film. However, I'm going to try to turn the redemption story kind of on its head a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so, but in any case, it's interesting how with a mystery there is that certain turn in the film where you know once ev when everything is revealed and an audience member kind of decides whether they love or hate this movie you know what I mean like it's sort of a different uh, different kind of relationship between filmmaker and audience in a mystery story as opposed to a comedy yeah it's like uh, certain genres create you know very definite expectations for for people and um, I mean Mysteries are just such a part of, you know, every, it's like every, everybody's grandma watches PBS Mystery and, you know, like the Poirot series and, and all that. So creating something that satisfies the the uh, expectations for, for, for that kind of story but also hopefully does something new. Um, yeah, no, it's a big it's a big challenge. But what I'm excited I'm excited to what I the reason that Xmas in July has me so excited is because, you know, this whole time we've been working together, it's always been on stuff that I directed, so it's kind of leaned a little bit more in the direction of my sensibility. Whereas I think that people who know you and your your work can can pick out the scenes that are yours or the lines that are yours and, and everything. We haven't, the world hasn't had this like unfiltered Joel Clark yet. And that <coughs> script was so funny and so, you know, original and crazy. I just, uh, man, I'm so excited to see it. So everybody's watching halfway there. You got to get, get on Kickstarter, throw down a little bit more cold, hard cash. <laughs> make sure that, to make sure that Joel gets this uh, gets this thing made. Yeah, that's right. We're uh, we're about halfway there on Kickstarter. We have um, we have ten days to go. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's do or die time for us over there. So if you want to check out the project page and uh, leave a comment, uh, leave leave some cold hard cash, as Dave puts it. Um, that would be much appreciated. Um, the film is uh, what what excites me about the film is um, you know I you know I I write crazy stuff all the time um, and uh, but what's exciting for me about this is the team of people I have together like yourself, Dave, uh, who's Dave is going to edit the feature, um, and I'll be very interested to to see how you handle uh, the 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 scenes that we get and everything. Um, oh, there it is. Who's that? <laughs> wow. Oh, it moves with you. Huh? It moves with you. That's nice. Yeah. I thought you said, who's with me? I was like, you see somebody behind me? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, no, I've got my cat behind me there. There she is. Um, hey. My cat will be playing Tiny Tim in the film. Um who is replaced by uh, a robotic cat uh, as we enter the fantasy realities. Um, she's barely awake over there. Um, but yeah, I have an amazing group of people together uh, here for this movie, musicians and actors and designers. Um, so you can check out on the project page everybody who's involved and trying to do these interviews with all my various collaborators. Um, but uh, but yeah, um, can uh, can I ask you a few questions, Dave, about low budget filmmaking? Sure. Uh, Dave has made now five films, um, uh, a few of which were on a, the micro scale, and we are kind of operating on that micro scale. So uh, my question for you is, um, how do you sort of ha what are some ways that you've figured out how to like maintain the product quality uh, when you're shooting on just a fraction of what a, a normal film or a Hollywood film or any film that you would see um, how you know how uh, how can you maintain the production value uh, with so little money um, 
Well, I I think it it's a uh, hmm. <laughs> I I, th I think a, a a lot of it is uh. I mean, you 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 basically just have to work with a team who really um, believes in what you're doing because they're they're. You know, they're obviously not going to be in into this project for the money, but people who understand and see the potential of it, and um, because basically what happens when you make a movie on a low budget is that just nobody gets paid. That's why it's that's why it's on a, that's why it's on a low budget. Everybody gets paid very little, and it's not a it's not a good feeling. It's not a it's not something that. I, th I think it's something that's celebrated a little bit too much in kind of the independent film world. I remember when I went to my very first um, film festival with my first movie, I was hanging out, out with these these filmmaker dudes, and and they they were uh, they were like, "So how much did your movie cost?" And uh, I told them, and then they kind of looked at each other like. <laughs> Well, ours only cost this, you know, ours only cost twenty five hundred dollars or something like that, and it, yeah. it was like the, this weird, like, uh, all right, you know. <laughs> um, I, I find that like the 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 budget number is largely irrelevant in terms of what you can achieve on screen in in a, in certain respect, you know, because I think on a, on a on on my two micro micro budget movies, Circuit Valentine, Daylight Savings, we didn't even have you know production design. We didn't have a production designer. We didn't have any art department. Um, and uh, and that that'll definitely affect how the movie looks because that's those are those are the people who are kind of creating stuff for you to look at. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I think what it comes down to is basically, in, with, with, with all that said, I think what it comes down to is just being really smart about choosing what your what subject matter you tackle, what scale you tackle it on, choosing your locations, um, because pretty much if if you don't have you know an an art department or or, or anything to kind of you. You know, a great cinematographer can only do so much without, you know, something interesting to look at. So, finding the the good locations and I don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, this is a this is a kind of like age old, kind of almost like redundant question. It's like, how do you make a good movie? And like, there's no real answer. You know, other than you try really hard and you and you uh, you try try to be intelligent and flexible. Um, we've already had uh, a bunch of speed bumps, you know, along the way. And you've been telling me, and other filmmakers uh, have been telling me, like, you know, it's very important to stay flexible, both with the money that you have and also just with with the script itself, you know, and like uh, because things come up, you know, where there's certain speed bumps and you're just like okay how do we get past this um, you know we have to shoot now and what's mm -hmm. the what's the solution here and like you have to keep uh, the grand view in mind while you're kind of making these logistics based decisions um, yeah it's a, in micro budget filmmaking I mean it the, the right choice is always to keep going you know it's always to like it's it's easy to um, I mean I, th I think on some bigger movies they have the luxury of working out uh, or you know, basically shutting down or or, or, or whatnot but I, I think that there's there's you know you, you do have to be flexible you do have to be imaginative and um, and also I just think that the choosing having the People that you really uh, that you really trust and respect and uh, and you know the, the the there has to be a mutual respect there and 
I've, once you're not paying people their rate, you know, to to work on something, you sort of you sort of lose your jerk license. You have to. I I don't think that you can't be like one of those filmmakers who's like screaming at people all the time. Right. Yeah, it's a balance. I mean, you know, since everybody on this project is working sort of out of goodwill, you know, um, you have to return that goodwill, you know, and, and, and make the situation fun, you know, and workable, uh, you know, and make it, you know, because it is, it's, it's kind of an amazing experience, you know, and, and I had such an amazing experience on set of Man From Reno, and I've been trying to kind of... Uh, as we do our shooting days here on Xmas in July, uh, trying to make it that kind of unique experience where, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to be able to pay full rate, um, but we are going to make something unique here. You know, we're going to, and like you say, keep going. You know, like, we're just going to keep going and, and, uh, and try to, and just try our very best and to create something uh, that we all kind of are excited about. And, you know, there was an amazing feeling after our two days of um, Charles Dickens versus Charles Darwin, uh, where myself and my wife Creighton were put into makeup by this incredible makeup artist uh, Ari Rosenbaum, um, and you know, we did our fight sequences. I had her crawling out of the ocean, you know, in her Charles Darwin makeup, and uh, you know, after those two shooting days. You know, everybody who was working on those days, we kind of had this euphoric feeling like we had created something. And whether, you know, who knows what people were going to think about it, but we we believed in it, you know, and, and we felt like we got the shots that we wanted to get. And, um, you know, regardless of how... how it turned out, how it turned out in the end, you know, we, we had been through something uh, together. And it was, uh, it was kind of an amazing feeling and... Uh, you know, and to, to try to keep that going for a full production schedule is probably very difficult to keep that energy up and, and that spirit up. Um, but, you know, that's the that's the whole challenge, I guess, at this level. Yeah. No, I mean, just, just keeping it... Uh, just, just keep it... You, you don't really have the money to keep it going, so you have to keep it going other ways. That's, yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, I guess uh, I guess we can kind of wrap it up here. Um, uh, it's been really good talking to you, Dave, and I'm glad you're alive. Thanks, uh, man. Your... Glad you're alive too. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've got another uh, chat coming up tomorrow uh, at 1 p.m. with. Uh, the musician Rubicon, who will be doing some music for the film and also some post-sound work. So we're going to be discussing sound and music and everything. That's at 1 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow. Uh, and then I've got a bunch more Google Chats lined up with other filmmakers and other collaborators as well. So if you want to go pop over to the Kickstarter page, Xmas in July, check out more about the project. Uh, and get cold involved. hard cash. <laughs> That's right, cold hard cash. Um, we have ten days left to meet our goal. We are halfway there, so anything you can drop will help. Uh, I want to give a quick shout out. Thank you to a donation that came in during this live chat from my good friend Mike Borden. Mike Borden. Yeah. Raising the roof. Raising the roof. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, um, pop on over to Kickstarter and get involved. Uh, thanks for chatting with me, Dave. Thanks, Joel. Sorry I was late. <laughs> you had a good excuse. Somewhat aloof. So, all right, guys. Bye, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern.